Cranky at the Cloquet Forestry Center. We have a rainy day uh, today. Uh, we've got 14 uh, participants on the program, and Lindbergh Eculi with the Minnesota Forest Resource Council will be speaking on integrating landscape stewardship approaches into the forest management program, private forest management program. So welcome, everyone. I've got a couple of announcements before we begin. If, uh, if you have any questions throughout the program, we have the chat pod in the upper left-hand corner of the screen. So uh, you can type your questions into the chat pod then click on to the little brain on the right. Questions will come up and the member can answer them uh, when he has a break uh, in his presentation. So you can uh, type in questions at any time uh, and then we'll also have questions and answers at the end of the program. The program will last about 45 minutes. Uh, Lindbergh's uh, PowerPoint presentation uh, will take uh, approximately 45 minutes, as I said, and then we'll have time for more uh, questions and answers or any questions and answers at the end of the program. So within our audience, we have quite a number of DNR people again. Welcome. Uh, we have so, uh, one Forest Service person with wildlife out of Deer River, a number of uh, Minnesota Forest Resource Council members, and we have a number of uh, consulting foresters, so uh, welcome. So uh, I'll introduce Lindbergh at this time. Uh, Lindbergh is the landscape, landscape Program Manager for the Minnesota Forest Resource Council. The council uh, is the state agency responsible for promoting the long-term sustainable management of forests throughout the state as directed by the Minnesota legislature in the Sustainable Forestry Resources Act of 1995. The Council advises the governor, federal, state, county, tribal, and local governments, as well as industry and private landowners on sustainable forest resource policies and practices. In his career over the past 27 years, Lindbergh has worked in a variety of public and private sector positions with an emphasis on integrating the management of natural resources, land use, and community development. Lindbergh served on the U.S. Forest Service Northeastern Area's Landscape Stewardship Planning Committee and was a primary author of the recently published U.S. Forest Service document, Landscape Stewardship Guide. So uh, I know uh, many of you uh, know Lindbergh, have worked with him, and the landscape uh, perspective is so important when thinking about site level decisions. So it's really good that Lindbergh uh, can explain the program and uh, the goals of the program as well today. So I'll turn it over to Lindbergh. Good morning, and thank you, Mike, for the introduction. And uh, sure. thank you for the opportunity to share information about uh, landscape stewardship and the things that are evolving here in Minnesota, as well as uh, some things from across the nation. Uh, we've got about 33 slides or so to go through, and uh, we'll go through those fairly quickly and um, just uh, refer to those slides as we go through. I'd like to um, touch base on five points in this presentation. First, talk a little bit about the stewardship reform, a call for a new approach by uh, the U.S. Congress and the Forest Service. Second, I'd like to talk about uh, the context that we have here in Minnesota for these more landscape or community-based approaches. Third, I'd like to cover uh, uh, some of the integration concepts that we're bringing to the private forest management program and applying landscape stewardship principles and practices. Fourth, uh, I'd like to give a quick recap on some of the stewardship, landscape stewardship projects that we have going. And fifth, just kind of cap it off with a uh, touching base on benefits of landscape stewardship. So to begin with, um, the call for reform, um, basically uh, with the last Farm Bill, the US Congress and its review of various programs uh, within the Farm Bill into the US Department of Ag, which the Forest Service is a part of, uh, looked at the private uh, lands program pretty uh, seriously. And uh, the map on the slide uh, now shows the 20 northeastern states, which I believe is Region 9 for the Forest Service. And when they <clears throat> compiled the numbers on the work that had been done across the lands, uh, the Forest Service basically analyzed uh, the amount of work that had been done over the past 10 to 15 years amounted to just under 10% of the privately owned forest lands in the northeastern region. And uh, concerns were raised that after that amount of time and millions of dollars that we just got to find ways to step up the work with private lands. It's not an easy uh, uh, mission to accomplish, but it certainly is a challenge. 
We've done a very good job in Minnesota. I think Minnesota is recognized as a leader in private forest management. But nonetheless, the call from Congress and Secretary Vilsack, as you'll see, we must dramatically accelerate the pace, scale and pace of forest stewardship on both public and private lands. Uh, in other words, we need to find ways, uh, the Forest Service continued in other reports, finding ways to dra dramatically increase the influence uh, and impact on keeping forests as forest. It's requiring us to uh, take new approaches and consider uh, in these new realities. So in that, uh, the Forest Service, with that direction from Congress, uh, as Mike introduced, I served on a committee. Andrew Ahrens, who is our former CFM supervisor, Cooperative Forest Management Supervisor for the Department of Natural Resources Forestry Division, um, was asked to be the chair of that committee, and I was asked to be a member. And the tasks that we were given in that committee included those that you see on the screen, uh, we've got a set of directions from the northeast area of uh, the Forest Service, as well as from the Northeastern Area Association of State Foresters. And we basically took that directive from them and uh, put together a work program where we uh, brainstormed a long list of questions that uh, the various members of this committee, there are about 20 people from the different states and uh, different entities working in the states in private forest management as well as a complement of Forest Service staff. And uh, in brainstorming the types of issues that we're facing private forest management and how services are delivered, that became a real strong foundation for the work that we then continued on. Um, basically, those list of questions and issues were sorted into a framework. Uh, basically, it goes through the same kind of things that we do in landscape management here in Minnesota, planning, coordination, implementation, monitoring, and evaluation four basic phases of, of a resource management program. And uh, from there, we were basically our overall charge was to develop some kind of a guidance document. I'm not really sure what that was. And so uh, we put together a booklet, and I'll show you the cover in just a minute. But that guidance document uh, basically took the work that the planning committee put together to guide how we take more collaborative or community-based approaches uh, to the private forest management world. We also put together a few little quick start brochures or things to help uh, CFM foresters and field foresters, extension folks, and others interested in private forest management better understand what we're trying to do with landscape stewardship. Uh, this initial committee, uh, our work became the base for follow-up work by other committees, including a group that works on marketing and, uh, and outreach. Uh, so landscape stewardship, what is it? It's an all-lands approach to forest conservation that works across multiple ownerships to address issues and opportunities identified in each state's forest action plan. What you see on the right is a cover uh, of the landscape stewardship guidance document that we prepared. And uh, you'll see that uh, this forest action plan, that is a, I'll show the next slide. Uh, this is the cover to the Minnesota's version of the state forest action plan. And this was also mandated by the recent farm bill that each state was to develop a five-year plan uh, guiding the use of federal dollars uh, from state and forestry, uh, the state and forestry program from the Forest Service. And uh, so they saw a strong connection between landscape stewardship and forest action plans. And we're really wanting to see states work more collaboratively to uh, address major forest resource issues and to be able to report that. So that's uh, the connection between the landscape stewardship guidance process and, and document we put together and these state forest action plans. Getting back a little bit to landscape stewardship and just kind of talking about what we mean, it's a collaborative, community-based approach to working with private landowners in a proactive way. Uh, rather than waiting for the landowners to come to uh, the service providers, it's, it's, it's providing that uh, service in that direction, but also being proactive and reaching out into communities. It's a creative, empowering process. We try to encourage lots of partners to come together where we can get a lot more things done by having the connections between, say, a department, uh, DNR Forestry, the field forester, uh, say, folks from wildlife uh, in DNR and fisheries and waters and eco-resources, and uh, then other state agencies such as Bowser, uh, working with folks from NRCS and uh, other private sector folks from consulting foresters uh, and uh, loggers and, uh, and landowner groups. So we're trying to find ways to connect many more things, many more dots, if you will, it's really what each local area puts together, what they want things, uh, issues that they want to try to address. And I'll talk about some of those in the next slide. The types of things that uh, can be addressed in a landscape stewardship project, 
Um, we develop a plan to guide uh, the different uh, efforts where we can make things come together. It might be something from an economic direction. It might be something from an ecological perspective, such as habitat. There may be a focus interest in a given geographic area uh, trying to promote increased tourism and recreation opportunities. Private forest management is very important in Minnesota, and uh, we'll talk about that in a few slides ahead, but uh, it is virtually in all states. And so trying to find a way to serve uh, hundreds or thousands of landowners in a collaborative way is a part of what we're trying to do with landscape stewardship. Connecting the dots is what we like to say. Who are some of the folks that should be involved? Well, I talked about that a little bit earlier. Uh, our state foresters and cooperative forest managers, Gary Michael is Minnesota's DNR CFM supervisor. Uh, <clears throat> we need their involvement. Field foresters, both from the public sector and private, uh, consulting foresters are a very important part of providing services to private landowners. We want to strengthen those working relationships with private consulting foresters throughout the state. Um, <clears throat> budget cuts to the DNR private forest management program have been significant, and uh, that's making an impact uh, to the services that the DNR can provide. And the most recent budget cut in the last two years was a 75% cut to the PFM program from general fund perspective. So that's a major hit. Uh, so this more collaborative approach with others, uh, including groups like soil water conservation districts. Uh, on the third line, you'll see also the RCDs, resource conservation development councils, and watershed districts can all play important roles as well. Forest Service, uh, throughout uh, the nation, there are different uh, Staff members from the Forest Service representing three branches all can play a role in landscape stewardship. Uh, other federal agencies that do work with uh, principally with farmers, but uh, as well as wildlife and, uh, and the recreation worlds can be, uh, should be a part of uh, a landscape stewardship endeavor. Extension, MFA uh, in Minnesota, uh, local woodland chapters can be very critical and we invite them to participate in projects. And I'll talk about some of the projects we've got going later in the slideshow. And uh, some of our other private sector representatives include loggers and contractors and vendors and so on, as well as our outdoor environmental organizations and youth. And uh, most importantly, it's the landowners. Um, we're trying to get more people involved in proactive ways to promote private forest management. That's at the heart of landscape stewardship. So it's also important that we think about this from a, oh gosh, from a, a government perspective uh, in the sense of how we design and integrate landscape stewardship. It needs to happen at multiple levels. And various people on the phone, as well as folks out in the state that we work with, work at different levels of governance, if you will. Some folks are much more involved at a policy level. And uh, persons like Gary Michael are involved with the PFM program, the Private Forest Management Program. And that's uh, yet another level. We have a number of landscape stewardship projects. And uh, we'll talk about those in a minute. And then all the way down to the on-the-ground work, the practices, those are very critical. And uh, we call it the four Ps. It's, in, it's important to see the integration of landscape stewardship or these kind of endeavors that they cut across all four levels to be successful. I'd give one quick example. Um, another sister program to landscape stewardship might be the FireWise program. And for FireWise, a federal program to be effective all the way down to the ground that type of a program needs to be uh, integrated into the state's uh, policy framework as it would need for uh, programmatic levels, projects, and practices. So, um, so that's a quick review of the four Ps, if you will. So I'm going to shift gears now into the next area and talk a little bit about the context of Minnesota and landscape approaches and what we have here. I think it's really important to recognize in Minnesota that uh, we have a lot of diversity from an ecological perspective, uh, and that forces us to really think hard about the landscapes that we have and how to manage those. The, grand, the landscapes, as you know, vary from the blufflands in the southeast uh, to the prairies out on the west uh, to the lakes and forests in northern Minnesota and the North Shore area. It's, uh, and then the hardwood hills uh, that exist in the western uh, between the prairie and the northern forest. That, We've, we've, in a sense, you could say we've got a lot in common with other states and that uh, we have uh, uh, similar kind of ecosystems that exist in other states. And it really creates a, a unique situation in Minnesota as a, as a model state for lots of other states and how we do things. I think part of the reason why um, that uh, the Forest Resource Council was created and uh, this more collaborative approach is that uh, 
the diversity in the ecology, but also in the land ownership patterns that we have in Minnesota, and they vary across each of those ecological areas. So in a sense, uh, Minnesota does have uh, a very long involved history when it comes to promoting sustainable forestry, and I think we've been quite successful. It is loaded with acronyms and jargon, and this slide hopefully kind of summarizes or uh, uh, puts it into context some of the major steps that we've gone through, including a petition with the Environmental Quality Board, the development of a generic environmental impact statement, the legislation known as the Sustainable Forest Resource Act, and the creation of the Forest Resources Council. This framework that was created in Minnesota, and this kind of runs through the slides of the history, um, is very important to how we do landscape stewardship. The creation of the Forest Resources Council and the kind of collaborative partnerships is foundational to the invention of these landscape stewardship approaches. So looking at this next slide is a kind of a chronology of the history of the things that we've gone through in the past uh, 20, 25 years, starting with uh, concerns that uh, different folks in the state had relating to the increased timber harvests uh, in the late 1980s um, and the ramping up of the forest industry. And so uh, in July of 1989, there was a petition submitted to the Environmental Quality Board and uh, that uh, uh, basically forced the creation or the development of a generic environmental impact statement, or GEIS. That study took four to five years, cost over a million dollars, and as you probably all know how environmental studies are put together, they basically try to assess uh, what the conditions are and uh, what different scenarios might be involved. And for the timber harvest and forest management considerations, three basic harvest scenarios were the kind of the foundation to the development of this environmental impact statement. Um, what these environmental studies do, regardless of what direction, they're trying to identify ways to support the mitigation of the potential adverse impacts of a given activity. In this case, it was timber harvest and forest management. The recommendations that came out of the environmental impact statement were included the need to address issues at a site and landscape level. And Mike kind of introduced that idea in the introductions and then the creation of some sort of a board or overarching state council. Um, this next slide kind of shows what resulted from all that work. And uh, this description of the Forest Resource Council, again, is foundational to landscape stewardship. Um, we have a council, 17 members appointed by the governor. They are the primary advisors to the governor and the legislature, who are the policy decision makers. Um, underneath all of that is the supporting framework of our practices or programs, if you will. We have a landscape program, which um, we'll talk more about, and our site level guidelines I'm sure you're all aware of. These two programs, these two practices, are supportive of the policy. And that policy information is shared up to the council. And uh, all of this is supported by the research and monitoring on the bottom side. And uh, we like to call this getting everyone on the same sheet of music as decisions are made going up the ladder, that it, decisions are brought back out to the practices. and. Uh, supports a much more collaborative approach to managing a natural resource like forest resources. So touching base a little bit on landscape management, again, this is providing context towards landscape stewardship. In Minnesota, we have divided the state into a number of different regions. There are six forested landscapes, the kinds of processes that we've gone through in creating a committee for each region and developing a long-range plan uh, basically is the initial part of the plan, uh, landscape management phases, if you will, four basic phases. And so the plans have been developed. Uh, we're now really in this coordination implementation stage along with monitoring and evaluation. And through each of these phases, we work to build partnerships. Uh, just to emphasize the size of those different regions we have in the state, and they were largely based on the ecological um, patterns that exist and occur throughout the state. And we tried to follow our administrative boundaries with those ecological boundaries as best we could. So through each of these phases, again, just repeating that it's important that we keep building partnerships in each and every phase. This chart shows a quick kind of summary. Our first generation, uh, the Council Landscape Program started officially in 1997, so we've been in place for some time. Uh, we're now in the process of updating our second generation plans. And uh, you can see in this table how we envision this being an intergenerational endeavor in promoting sustainable forestry across the state. The scales, um, maybe to help amplify the differences or what are we talking about, uh, when we talk landscape, it's something that's regional. And you can see that the landscape plans uh, for each of the forested regions cover four to nine million acres. And uh, at the site level, our site level guidelines or best management practices uh, really promote uh, 
sustainable practices on given sites, possibly maybe up to 1,000 acres. That leaves a lot of room in between the landscape and the site level. Uh, we basically, with our regional committees, are working now into this realm of in-between land, uh, if you will, the sub-landscape level. And there's multiple different levels of opportunities that exist in between these two major scales of landscape and site. So we're about halfway through the slides. And uh, I'm just going to kind of focus in now on the kind of collaborative areas uh, that the regional committees have been working on over the past 8, 9, 10 years, um, or perhaps longer, in trying to take those regional landscape plans, those regional forest management plans, and to make them um, become a reality. Uh, they've uh, started to identify topics that are of real interest in supporting the implementation of those plans. They include wildlife management, uh, excuse me, forest management, wildlife habitat, recreation, water resources, land management, and economic development. The types of projects that the committees are doing under those categories then, um, they principally have three different approaches that they've identified over the last uh, eight to 10 years as to how to advance those particular project categories uh, of uh, forest management or wildlife habitat and so on. Principally outreach and education projects, research and development, and then on the ground or opportunity area projects, like the two that are noted on the bottom, um, are, are things that the, the committees have been taking on over the past numerous years to try to help support the implementation of the goals and strategies in the landscape plans. You can find more information about the, the landscape plans in our council website, and that information is provided at the end of the PowerPoint, and you'll see that slide when I get to the end. Project and funding development to make these projects and these ideas happen um, is a good foundation for uh, supporting uh, the implementation of the landscape plans. And over the past uh, eight or so years, our regional landscape committees, which are composed of a broad range of uh, representatives, much like the Forest Resource Council is composed, um, have helped to develop over 30 different collaborative forestry projects. Uh, the partners have obtained over $20 million in federal, state, and, and funds from private sources for a variety of forestry projects. Uh, within that, we've obtained five grants from the Forest Service for promoting landscape stewardship projects uh, that support the uh, more proactive efforts towards private forest management endeavors. The regional committees also have an advisory role uh, to the council. And as stated in Statute 89A, each regional committee shall provide a regional perspective to the council uh, re with respect to the council activities. The council puts together a, uh, a forest policy framework every four years and this provides a great opportunity for the regional committees to provide input on the issues that they believe uh, are of critical interest to their given region. This next slide illustrates those high priority areas that uh, each of the regions uh, think are critical to be addressed and that they wanted the Forest Resources Council to include in their forest policy development process in this last go-round, uh, which happened about two years ago. You can see in looking at the different issues that uh, Private forest land management or topics relating to that are critical to all six committees. So I think that kind of puts into context the private land ownership is important in all the regions of the state. The power of collaboration, I think, is really uh, critical. Um, and when you get the kind of connections between these regional committees with the council and with our partners across the state in trying to address uh, sustainable forest management issues in much more effective, comprehensive, and holistic approaches. So continuing a little bit more discussion about the regional committees and how they function, um, this is another way that uh, the committees are supporting the development of projects uh, within the regions and at a local level. Uh, our committees have really been working hard to identify priorities for the various studies, including the Forest Action Plan uh, that's down in the bottom in green, as well as the 25-year forest habitat vision that was submitted to the Lassard Outdoor Heritage Council. And I think there might be a person or two uh, that's uh, participating today that are from outside the state. And if you're not aware of uh, that uh, number of years ago, about four or five years ago, the state, uh, the citizens passed a, a constitutional amendment supporting the increase of a sales tax to help fund conservation outdoor projects. And that's our, our legacy fund that will provide over a 25-year period up to $7 billion for uh, clean water, the outdoors, uh, habitat, parks and recreation, and uh, the arts. And so that funding is a tremendous opportunity for us in Minnesota to leverage 
uh, not only federal dollars, but uh, local dollars and private dollars. And we're certainly eyeing the opportunities with that money for private forest land management. So that should be good news to all of you that work in the private forest management world. Our committees have worked hard to help set the priorities for how to spend that money. So that, uh, in a way, to try to summarize what we do at the council as well as with the regional landscape committees is to, to build partnerships. And we really focus on three major philosophies. A, it's voluntary. We work to grow trust with partners. B, it's collaborative. We encourage sharing across the board um, as we do these projects. And C, it's a very creative endeavor in trying to encourage the application of knowledge from the research. We've got a tremendous research uh, uh, opportunities here in Minnesota or uh, people to work with. So we think these are foundational in developing this uh, landscape vision and how we get things done in Minnesota. I'm going to start uh, moving now into some of the projects that we have as it relates to landscape stewardship. And as you saw in an earlier slide, uh, in terms of priority issues for each of the regions, private forest management is certainly an important thing um, uh, to all the regions and the committees. <clears throat> One of the initial projects that occurred before the process that Andrew Ahrens and I got engaged with, uh, with the Forest Service, was a project that uh, was based out of the East Central Landscape region. Uh, the East Central Committee completed its regional forest plan in the year 2005. And when they, um, with the approval by the council of that plan, they started thinking immediately about how do we start to get this plan implemented. The East Central region covering uh, four and a half million acres, it's difficult to develop a project that's going to cover that much territory. And so they decided to focus in uh, a specific area, and that's at the crosshairs of four counties. And they call it the Four Corners Project, where they're working with four townships, one from each of the four counties. In that given jurisdiction, in that area of those four townships, it covers just under 100,000 acres of land. There's very little public land, but a lot of private land. It's a landscape that used to be heavily forested, and today uh, is uh, much lighter in terms of forest cover. Uh, from memory, I think it's got about 30% forest cover at a time it had probably somewhere between 75 and 80% forest cover pre-settlement. So some major changes uh, in land cover patterns over the past 100 years, and uh, as a result, some major impacts to water quality and other resources like that. And so they wanted to try to find a way uh, as a committee to support more work done on private forest land in collaborative, kind of uh, proactive ways. Uh, they partnered together with uh, the DNR Forestry, with the Soil Water Conservation Districts, consulting foresters, and other folks uh, that were involved with the regional committee. And they basically tried to pull together a project to, uh, that would find ways to increase the amount of outreach to landowners. Uh, they developed some survey tools, and they held a number of education events. They also tried to find ways to better manage the data of information that would come back from landowners all with the purpose of trying to increase more forest stewardship planning. And the committee is also working towards trying to find dollars to support then the on-the-ground uh, implementation of practices with private landowners. This is a project that started in 2005. And again, it predates the efforts of uh, uh, the Forest Service and Landscape Stewardship Initiative that they've taken on. But uh, it's a reflection of uh, a group of people coming together trying to make a good thing happen in a given smaller geography. Today, we do have, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there are five federal grants that have been awarded uh, to the DNR and the Forest Resources Council from the Forest Service State and Private Program. And uh, those projects are listed on this slide. Uh, the first grant was a proposed, uh, what we proposed back in uh, about four years ago was to develop a, a pilot project, one for each landscape region. And the Four Corners uh, received continuing funding for the East Central. The five other landscape regions then have a pilot project as well. In addition to that first grant, uh, some of the other landscape stewardship projects that we have going from the other grants include a project for Camp Ripley, a landscape stewardship plan for the Whitewater area, as well as the Root River. And then we also have a project in the St. Croix. We're developing landscape stewardship plans and the corresponding projects for a watershed in Minnesota, as well as a watershed in Wisconsin. So for the person from Wisconsin, uh, be aware that we're doing some work with your partners over there and trying to encourage the integration of landscape stewardship concepts and private forest management in Wisconsin. So what are some of the goals of doing these landscape stewardship projects? 
Well, principally, we're trying to develop these coordinated alliances with service providers from a given geography. And to do, the, do that in such a way that we can support the protection of water quality, improving habitat, addressing invasive species issues, it might be within a geography of a set of townships, like you saw with the Four Corners, or it might be on a watershed basis, or the development of these landscape stewardship projects could focus on something relating to invasive species. Maybe there's an area of buckthorn uh, that needs to be addressed. These landscape stewardship projects can cover a smaller area of maybe a couple thousand acres, or they could be expanded all the way up to something like the watersheds, uh, like the whitewater or root, uh, covering a million or more acres of, of area. Uh, we're also trying to develop a, a much more coordinated outreach and education effort to more effectively reach landowners. Uh, by identifying specific issues such as water quality or habitat, we think that's a, a general way to improve, a general strategy as to how to improve our outreach and education efforts if we target in on specific issues that landowners really care about. Um, a third bullet illustrates that uh, in our goal is to uh, these landscape stewardship projects is to develop a plan, uh, a document that guides how we reach out uh, to these landowners in a given geography and how we as resource managers will work together to try to bring those service to, services to those landowners. Um, it's a much more diversified uh, network of service providers today than it was 10, 15, 20 years ago. And so we need to find ways to get the working relationships between consulting foresters, DNR field foresters, um, the Soil Water Conservation Districts, NRCS, and other agencies and partners to make a more collaborative impact in working with private landowners across these larger landscapes. One of the ways that we can help do that in our plans is to develop these 10-year project lists. Within these landscape stewardship areas, we will define even smaller projects and uh, go after funding. Uh, as you can see from the earlier slides, the regional committees have been very aggressive in trying to help find ways to support increased funding for private forest management in Minnesota. So this should be very good news to folks that are uh, in the consulting forestry world. We're trying to find more resources for you guys to serve, your men and women that serve uh, private landowners across the state in writing stewardship plans. And uh, we're also trying to find resources for our partners uh, and agencies, including soil water districts and, uh, and uh, the DNR itself. So I'm um, going to talk a little bit about uh, or present a few diagrams that hopefully will illustrate some of these concepts a little bit further. Uh, given or due to the limits of the technology that I have, this slide is one that uh, is meant to illustrate these working relationships between the different partners in this landscape-based approach, as well as some of the different tools. And um, uh, I'm trying to move the screen here a little bit so I can see the whole screen. But uh, essentially, the uh, work with landowners is the foundation that we're trying to get at. And we're trying to find ways to connect, in this diagram, landowners with um, major uh, issues that are out there, things like water quality, air quality, uh, habitat, recreation, timber production, uh, timber production. Now, how the heck do we do that? Well, we've got a team of folks out there that are currently serving our landowners, and uh, includes the folks that work for DNR, the field foresters, uh, so out of conservation districts and our consulting foresters. We're looking for ways to help unite that team uh, of folks and help them work more collaboratively in especially these high priority areas and get more things done. Our regional committees have addressed these different issues uh, that you see in the clouds in their plans in large measure. And uh, we want to try to bring in some of the goals that they've set uh, that kind of uh, help define with more clarity what individual sites, individual landowners can do to promote uh, implementation of these goals. And uh, there's also on the right-hand side a set of overarching um, documents that guide resource management in the state, uh, as well as the spending of money, these policy directives uh, that come in the different plans, uh, not only our landscape plans, but other documents that uh, are supported by uh, DNR, including the Forestry, St Forestry Strategic Initiative, uh, the DNR's Conservation Networks, uh, the state forest action plans. I think you could add in there other things like county water plans, watershed district plans, plans developed by the RCDs, and a whole host of other folks as well. Uh, on the left-hand side are the folks that are the collaborators trying to help bring this together to help us find the funding to make things happen. 
And uh, most recently, we, in grant number five that we received from the Forest Service, is funding to help get additional capacity through the hiring of landscape foresters. And most recently, we've hired two people, Amanda Keeper and Mike Lynch, uh, DNR and uh, Forest Resources Council, in bringing uh, additional capacity to help get at these types of projects and uh, help provide a connection between the regional committees uh, with the service provider teams and ultimately to the landowners. So I know it's a bit diagrammatic and, uh, um, and it works better when these things shoot out across the slide one at a time, but uh, again, um, it hopefully will give you a little bit of an orientation of a big picture of how all this starts to come together. This next slide illustrates a range of the tools that are available to all of us in serving private landowners. They're placed on this arrow or this line, uh, the spectrum, if you will, a continuum. And these services are ranked on the left-hand side of your slide from being lower cost in nature, less permanent, but providing perhaps fewer social benefits. And you go to the right side, uh, something like a fee title acquisition, certainly that costs much more. It's, more. it's permanent in nature and provides greater societal benefits. One of the major drivers that the Forest Service has in this landscape stewardship initiative is to try to encourage not only benefits for individuals, but to seek out those kind of projects that support uh, opportunities for increasing benefits to society or to the greater good. These different uh, tools that are here can provide benefits not only to individuals, but also to the, to the common good or to society. So this spectrum simply is just a, uh, a way of helping to organize those different tools and maybe begins to give us as a diversified network of service providers a way to communicate and work together to provide the full toolbox. We, we want to try to encourage the full implementation of this toolbox across these landscapes in ways that meet the needs of individual landowners and at the same time create benefits for the public. I hope that this slide, as, as well as the earlier, the previous slide, are, are helpful to start putting more of this into context and be very interested in hearing more comments and questions from you. A third diagram, if you will, is this table in that uh, we're trying to encourage ways uh, of increasing how we serve landowners. What, there's uh, upwards of 200,000 uh, private landowners of, uh, of uh, woodlands in Minnesota. And so those landowners, that's a pretty big uh, number of people to try to serve. Currently, we really have one method of serving those landowners, and that's our traditional forest stewardship plan. The basic idea behind this is to give landowners options and uh, to also then coordinate the options of the planning service then with the types of implementation or those, the toolbox above that we guide the investment of public dollars uh, with the amount of effort and energy that private landowners are willing to put in to a project on their land. So this is another diagram that I hope um, will take root with a lot of people, and uh, it's gotten a lot of uh, interest and traction from the Forest Service on down, uh, from DNR administration and uh, members on the Forest Resource Council and so on. So we're trying to find a way to work more effectively and comprehensively with a big number of landowners. These concepts in these last slides, I think, help you understand some of the ways that we can be more proactive and more comprehensive and more effective in reaching larger numbers of landowners. And again, I think we can create a lot of good benefits both for individuals and the greater good by working in these kind of fashions. Organizing structures uh, through these landscape stewardship projects, we basically have three different kind of groupings. One is an initial project steering team. Uh, you need some partners just to get the project idea going, whether it was something like in St. Croix or around Camp Ripley. Once you got a group uh, and you got some funding to work with, there needs to be some sort of a planning slash coordination committee. Uh, they're responsible for putting together the landscape stewardship plan and to start that coordination of, of the actual work once the plan is done. And then last is an implementation team, uh, some sort of group that will continue to meet on a regular basis for a given geography, for this given ge uh, landscape project like the Four Corners. Um, on an earlier slide, I think we talked about uh, uh, these projects take time. Um, uh, one of our committee members uh, talked about, you know, if, if we don't think that this Four Corners project is going to take 10 years in time, you're crazy. You know, it's at a minimum. Uh, these kind of in areas need focus for a number of years. Forestry is a long-term endeavor, and we have to stay focused on serving these kinds of projects. Um, and so 
those are some of the organizing structures behind uh, what we put together in these landscape stewardship projects. So I'm getting close to uh, wrapping up on the slides and maybe just to touch base with uh, everybody in terms of the benefits. I've uh, tried to allude to some of that with the um, diagrams that I went through describing landscape stewardship. But when you get a group of people working together, thinking about what needs to be done in a given area, um, I think we can get a heck of a lot more done. And uh, what this landscape stewardship uh, process is about is uh, helping us unite our forces so that we can get more good things done together. On this slide, uh, we've got a logger on the left, a DNR forester to, uh, to his left, a representative from the Nature Conservancy. Uh, a person, uh, the next is involved in education with landowners and, uh, and a farmer, and then a, a state agency person representing the Board of Water and Soil Resources. At this meeting, we had a state senator, and uh, we have a couple of township officials and just a whole mix of different folks coming together to try to find ways to make good things happen in forestry across the lands. So the benefits that come from landscape stewardship is that we get more done um, in ways that benefit private landowners as well as public. So working together, when we work together, uh, when people grow, benefits flow. And uh, that's a big part of uh, what landscape stewardship's all about, in fact, any resource management endeavor. And so whether it's uh, increased understanding of how the natural resources work, um, to, uh, on the ground field projects, uh, tree planting and timber stand improvement, habitat projects, uh, to a whole host of things, uh, to actual timber harvest. Those are all things that we're looking to help grow as opportunities to promote sustainable forestry, the implementation of our Forest Resources Council plan, as well as the State Forest Action Plan, and other kinds of plans that uh, people care about. So the last slide is the contact information that I have. And um, so I'm just kind of getting things wrapped up here. Uh, Gary Michael, again, is our CFM supervisor from the Department of Natural Resources Division of Forestry. His contact information is provided uh, on the left. Uh, my information is provided on the right. Um, I did want to make one other comment and that had to do with uh, an earlier slide that it, uh, described the Forest Resources Council. And um, I just wanted to um, amplify that in the creation of the Sustainable Forest Resources Act and the Council, uh, this organization, Mike, that uh, you oversee, the Sustainable Forest, uh, Forestry Education Cooperative, is um, its foundations and its originations come from the same legislation as the council. So I didn't uh, mention that earlier in the presentation, Mike, but I think it's worth noting, and we greatly appreciate the work you do to help educate natural resource professionals in the state of Minnesota, and uh, we enjoy working with you closely. So thank you, Mike, for that opportunity to run through some of these concepts on landscape stewardship. I know I've been talking fast for a long time. I hope these slides help. And please go back and look at those slides. Feel free to call me anytime if you have any questions beyond or after today. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Lindbergh. A very uh, interesting presentation. You've done so much work uh, with all your partners um, over these years. And the fruits of your work are, are becoming very evident. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, so those of you online, please uh, type in any questions or comments you might have. I have one that I typed in, and I'll bring it up right now. Uh, Lindbergh, I'll let you read it. <laughs> yes. Getting a copy of uh, the Landscape Stewardship Guide, it's available on the uh, Forest Service website. Um, let me, I've got uh, the web address. Uh, it's www.landscapestewardship.org. And we can send that out to all the folks that participated in today's event um, in an email so that they get that. But again, okay. www.landscapestewardship.org. There should also be a link, Mike, on the US Forest Service uh, website. Very good. You see that Philip is typing in a question, so I'll give him a couple minutes here. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry that I talked so fast, uh, and I don't know. We can't really talk to the folks right now one-on-one uh, -on -one with the phone. But uh, for certain, if people have questions, I'm happy to visit uh, by phone or at uh, in another event in the future. A lot of ground to cover. I think I got it in 45 minutes, though, Mike, didn't I? Uh, you did. You did a, a really good job. It, it's amazing the amount uh, of people that you reach uh, in all the different committees. and. 
different agencies. Uh, so you articulated uh, uh, what you're doing very well. Uh, I, I know we all appreciate very much what you're doing. Thank you. It, it does take a lot of explaining, and uh, there's a lot of history in Minnesota with the council and the landscape program that are the foundation to landscape stewardship. So I really appreciate um, people you know, taking time to learn about this. Uh, mm -hmm. Phillips question, the forested areas of northwest mm -hmm. Minnesota uh, have been left out of the Forest Resource Council committees. Any chance of having one? Uh, that's a good question, Philip. Um, there is definitely a chance. The metro area and the prairie uh, currently do not have committees. Um, the council did consider um, the idea of creating a committee for the metro area, and they did. Uh, it was probably about six, seven years ago, and uh, they decided uh, there was not funding provided by the legislature. It does cost money to convene a group and to put together a plan. Uh, there just haven't been resources. Uh, staff have worked with uh, other partners in the metro area to try to come up with some funding. We got about halfway there. Uh, it could be possible, but at this point we just, uh, uh, there hasn't been a, a groundswell for that. If you have an interest in that uh, for a metro area, please call me. If uh, in terms of the prairie area, um, the DNR has developed a prairie management plan. And over the past two years, we've been working with NRCS and uh, a host of different uh, entities in advancing that prairie plan. And in a sense, it kind of serves as a, as a, a plan for that region. There, unfortunately, is not a committee. Uh, we're suggesting possibly the creation of a North Prairie and a South Prairie because it's such a huge geographic area that uh, convening of some sort of committee would be a good thing. Our West Central Committee does have significant prairie areas in it and kind of serves as a de facto uh, committee that extends out into the prairie area. And we do have some representatives from the prairie landscapes that participate on the West Central Committee. So we're definitely interested. We think there's a resource. I think there's a chance. It just needs support and people to help push it. Mike's got a question. How important are the consultant foresters with reaching private landowners? Uh, we think uh, very important, uh, very instrumental, and very much that uh, we want consulting foresters to be partners with uh, our efforts. Uh, and by our efforts, it's meant to be a very inclusive uh, uh, approach. Um, our pilot projects, the consulting foresters have provided uh, a lot of the legwork in connecting with landowners, and we, in, we, in, we would uh, encourage that in the future. Uh, we think that consulting foresters are uh, a critical part of the foundation of service delivery to private landowners, and we want to grow that. Um, oh, great. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, Jeff uh, has the link to the Landscape Stewardship Guide, so it's right there on the screen for everybody. Thank you very much, Jeff. Jeff, by the way, is our GIS uh, coordinator for uh, the Forest Resource Council and uh, being our forestry PFM program. So uh, thank you very much, Jeff, for sending that information in. Rebecca is typing in um, a question. And Rebecca, you're our Wisconsin person. What is the process for setting priorities uh, for each landscape? Um, the process initially is in, that, in the planning process when we develop the, the landscape plans. Um, um, what we've been doing with the regional committees is asking them, OK, you've got your landscape plan developed. Now let's go back and prioritize the goals and strategies that you've put into that, and then sort that into some sort of a work plan. Those work plans from six, seven, eight years ago are the foundations to how we started going after projects. The subsequent other types of prioritizations that you saw back on slide number oh, in the middle or so, uh, the prioritization efforts, um, um, those prioritization efforts, basically, we put together um, kind of these worksheets for the regional committee's individual members to all respond to as it relates to one of those different um, efforts, whether it be the uh, State Forest Action Plan. And we collect up their individual input and put together a tabulated report and then bring that back to the committee and get discussion. So we have a pretty involved uh, process. It's fairly informal, but um, it's one that the regional committees uh, are very active in and have helped set priorities not only in the plans themselves, but also in these other kind of policy documents that come along the way, including the State Forest Action Plan. It's essential. Uh, for this kind of stuff to happen, to have these convening forums of the landscape committees. And to my knowledge, I mean, Minnesota and the, uh, the Forest Resources Council, we're very unique in the country in how we're organized and structured to have a council at a statewide level. A lot of states have those, but ours has these practice programs involved as well. 
Let's see, I see Amanda and uh, Amber have uh, noted that Dennis McDougall from State and Private Forestry, have uh, he has paper copies of the Landscape Stewardship Guide as well. Thank you, uh, Amber and Amanda, for identifying that. And Dennis is located in the St. Paul uh, U.S. Forest Service uh, State and Private Office on the U of M campus. Uh, Dennis's contact info, um, let's see, I do. Um, Amber, do you have that more handy? My, I think I'm kind of locked into my screen right now. And uh, if not, we can get that out to folks. Um, I'm sure if one typed in the U.S. Forest Service website in the directory and typed in Dennis McDougall, um, one could find him as well. Looks like we still have, are we going to go till 10 o'clock, Mike? Or Jean? Um, <clears throat> welcome. Please hold while I confirm your passcode. Thank you. Your passcode is confirmed. When you hear the tone, you will be the third person to join the meeting. Development partnerships help to establish the webinars with the Sustainable Forest Education Cooperative about four years ago. Uh, Lindbergh's webinar will be archived on the SFEC website if anyone would like to uh, go back and review his slides or refer the program to other people. We've got about 30 webinars archived on the SFEC website, so it's a, a ready reference for all of you um, uh, to look at. <clears throat> Thank you, Mike. And I see on. Amber and Amanda have uh, put in uh, Dennis's contact information, so appreciate that. And yep. uh, getting back to Rebecca's question, the process for setting um, priorities for each landscape, you know, um, Education topics is another uh, item that's not on that list uh, earlier in the slideshow that we've asked regional committees, prioritize uh, what kinds of things uh, are important for educating uh, resource professionals in your region. And uh, they've done that a couple of different ways. And uh, one is that they prioritize the topics that they have. Our, our regional committees meet four times a year. And at those quarterly meetings, uh, generally the morning, it's a day-long meeting, and uh, generally those meetings, the first half of the day is dedicated towards presentations and information sharing. And uh, so they continually work to educate themselves on issues that occur in the region and to better understand forest policy kind of the topics that are out there. And, uh, and so they prioritize for themselves what they're going to hear over the next year and two, three years. But they also help uh, set some priorities uh, and can and will be increasing that with Mike for SFEC as well as uh, we'd like to increase the connection with the Minnesota Logger Education Program and Dave Chura and helping some set some priorities there, um, as well as with Extension Service. So those are all very important partners to us, and setting priorities in the education realm is, uh, I think, a very important endeavor. Our committees have been very fluid in providing these kind of recommendations. I mean, it's not been, in, uh, they've been very interested in supporting setting priorities. <clears throat> I'd be curious from anyone on the phone if you've come across anything like the structure that we have, the Forest Resource Council, the regional committees, the connection between policy development, program development, projects, and actual practices on the ground. And uh, at any time, if anyone's got uh, examples of where it's all packaged up like that, I'd, I'd be very happy to see that, or any parts of those. I hope you find the four Ps, the concept of those four Ps, to be very useful in all all your endeavors. We need to work across those four levels much more strategically and collaboratively to improve how we govern resource management. I had a phone call from uh, Wisconsin, some colleagues in Wisconsin who are looking at Minnesota Forest Resource Council uh, as an example um, to emulate uh, in Wisconsin. I know uh, there's a uh, Governor's Council on Forestry in Wisconsin, but I, I do not believe they've been as active as what uh, Wisconsin or what Minnesota has been. So um, <clears throat> I, I know there's uh, a lot of eyes focused on the work that the Minnesota Forest Resource Council is doing in Minnesota, at least from Wisconsin and probably other states too. You bet. And and uh, and it's a it's a nice sharing relationship that has grown over the years between say Minnesota and Wisconsin. I know uh, Missouri uh, Gary Michael hails from Missouri as does Amanda Keeper, and I think those connections are, are good ones as well. <clears throat> but uh, 
um, the connection with Wisconsin, for example, that landscape stewardship project, as well as the site level guidelines, there's been some very good sharing between the two states. We certainly want to keep growing that kind of relationship. <clears throat> Okay, I think we're pretty well uh, close to the end of the program. I want to make a couple of announcements. I want to thank you again, Lindbergh, for an excellent program and taking the time and sharing your, um, your great program and, and collaborative efforts and uh, goals for the future and, um, and projects. So I, I want to thank you for, for your time and efforts. Um, and then I also want to thank uh, all of you online and, and also not only for participating, but for, uh, for uh, the work that you're doing. So um, I've got a couple of announcements. We have other programs coming up. We've got a real busy uh, month uh, in June. Uh, at the end of May, May 30th, we have a fungi and mushrooms program over the Northwoods. Larry Weber is an author, uh, and Roy Hagen is a consulting with the United Nations. He's a uh, real, uh, both of them are real experts on mushrooms and fungi. We've got uh, two stewardship plan writer workshops, which uh, are very much uh, a part of what uh, what uh, Lindbergh has been talking about, Gary Michaels and I, and uh, in the SFEC have been working together to develop the workshops. One uh, is June 5th in, uh, at the Cookie Forestry Center and June 12th uh, down in uh, Uatana, uh, south of uh, St. Paul. Uh, we've got two uh, ECS silviculture uh, programs coming up June 6th, uh, mixed species with Cheryl Adams. We've got a class of about 30 individuals, uh, but there's still room for a few more. And June 27th uh, with Jason Meyer in uh, St. Louis County on Pine uh, Field Day. Uh, <clears throat> so we have um, a number of different uh, ECS uh, classes coming up. So our next webinar is Wood Utilization Zero Waste uh, uh, Revolution with Dovetail. Jim Bauer is a PhD uh, with uh, Dovetail. Uh, Katie Fernholtz is uh, working with us to deliver some of their program content. We have four of their webinars coming up as well this fall. So uh, keep those in mind. And if you'd like to listen to uh, this archived webinar, again, go on to SFEC website in the upper left-hand corner. Click on the past webinars, and you'll be able to, uh, to view the webinar. So with that in mind, I see no more questions. Uh, Lindbergh, thank you again. I yeah. appreciate your time and your uh, delivery of, a, of your message. Thank you. Thank you.